Childhood obesity is both an immediate and future health problem in our society. We'll explore this alarming reality when we come back. In January, it's so nice. Hi, I'm Bruce Grantham, and welcome to Our Children, Our Future, a program about education in the South San Francisco Unified School District. Studies on health trends related to the problem of overweight youth indicate that one out of three children being born today will get diabetes in their lifetime. This is alarming news. With me to explore this topic is Dr. Thomas Robinson, Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine. Dr. Robinson focuses on solution-oriented research, developing and evaluating health promotion and disease prevention intervention for children and adolescents and their families. Dr. Robinson, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Dr. Robinson, just how big a problem is the weight of our younger population, and, and how has this occurred? Well, this is, this is really the major epidemic we're going to see probably for the next at least several decades and maybe for the next century. It's really amazing how quickly this is, has really come upon us. We've never seen an epidemic that's really changed this drastically. And along with it has come tremendous burden of health problems for, uh, for children while they're still children and in their teen years, but as well as what it's gonna, uh, gonna create for their future health problems um, as they move into young adulthood and adulthood. Uh, we have a couple slides that that show changing rates of obesity and overweight in children. And um, why don't we take a look at those now? Can we take a look at the first one? Yeah. Yeah, the first slide shows that uh, the increasing rates of obesity over the past um, four decades or so. And this is all the, the national surveys that have been done in children from the 1960s, which are the bars that are in orange, and those are just in the age group of six to 11 year olds, as you can see. Um, up through the 70s, early 70s, uh, mid 70s to, to early 80s is the green bar. Uh, 1988 to 1994 surveys is the kind of aqua bar. And the red bar is the most recent survey that has been done is 1999 to 2002. And the red bar is a huge jump. Right. And what we've seen is really since the 1980s, we've seen this drastic increase in the rate of overweight kids. And this is defined based on the 95th percentile from what used to be the normal size of children. So those growth charts that you have that, that parents know from their pediatrician's offices um, have different percentile curves. This is, is the proportion of kids who are now above the 95th percentile from those older curves. So what this shows is that we've had a doubling to a tripling in the number of kids who are overweight just in the last two to three decades. That's an astounding change over such a short period of time. We've never seen any epidemic of a problem like this that's occurred so quickly. We have another slide that shows that the distribution isn't equal across the group. So let's show the other slide now. The other, this slide, just, you just a see, second. What are the numbers on the left-hand side? Oh, sorry about this. I'm used to looking at figures all the time, and sure. I forget to, to, to preface it. But the numbers on the left side are the percentage of children in the population. Okay. And what we saw on the last slide is that nationally, uh, it's estimated that about 16% of, of children in this country are overweight already. Um, now, I can tell you from work we've done in this school district and other local Bay Area school districts that what we're seeing already in 2005 is that at least 25% of kids are overweight in our local schools. Mm -hmm. And that's really a, a scary figure. That means it's continuing to increase at a rapid rate. What you see in this slide is that the difference is by ethnic group. It's not all groups have not been affected the same. And in fact, uh, particularly Mexican-American boys, which is the red bar on the left here, mm -hmm. and Mexican-American girls, the red bar on the right, as well as African-American girls in particular, which is the blue bar on the right, are at much higher risk than other groups. 
And so those are our kids who really we need to look out a little more closely after in terms of, of watching their uh, health habits and the risk for obesity. What's the cri uh, criterion used to determine if a child is overweight or obese? Well, it's really based on national norms, and those come from those growth charts that pediatricians have in their offices. And we those use, are changing? Uh, no, well, we have new ones came out in the year 2000, mm -hmm. and they're not necessarily changing. Those were meant to come out, they came out from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and those were meant to create the standard by which all other our, by all growth would be compared. Mm -hmm. And those are, in fact, fairly conservative. And those are the, the, the criteria that come from, uh, come from uh, the national data that I've shown and that really are used to determine weight in a, in, a child, in a pediatrician's office. The best way to find out if your child is overweight is really to, to ask your pediatrician how they look on the growth charts, how they look in particular on something called the body mass index chart. And your pediatrician can plot the height and weight on those charts and, and tell you where your child uh, charts out. What's contributed to this situation? How, how, you said it's epidemic. And, you, and it's happened rapidly. What, what are the contributing factors? I think well, we know some of the more obvious ones, but I think they're worth repeating, and, and there's some that aren't quite so obvious, I don't think. Right, it's, a, it's a many different factors. I mean, to start with, and we actually have a third slide that sort of illustrates this, and why don't we go to the third slide now, is uh, it's all based on energy imbalance. So the calories taken in are greater than the calories that are burned or calories that go out. It's very simple thermodynamics. You take in more calories than you burn, you're going to gain weight. If you burn more calories than you take in, you're going to, going to reduce your weight. Um, however, it's not just uh, eating and what you eat that seems to make the difference in terms of calories in and calories out. For one thing, its genes are involved. And every family has its genes that, that help determine what their susceptibility is to different problems and different diseases. Mm -hmm. So genes are involved, but that's not the big problem because we didn't see this. All these genes weren't, were here. All the genes that we have in our families were here 20 years ago and 30 years ago as well before this epidemic. So what we've seen is an interaction of the genes plus the environment. And what that, that shows is that when you expose people who are efficient to, uh, in terms of handling energy, and they're put into an environment where food is very easy to find and cheap and exercise is tough to find and, and difficult to, to find in our environment, you end up with rapid weight gain. So what are the, what are the specific habits then that have contributed to this? Well, it's, it's, as I said, it's many different things. We have a society where we've engineered physical activity out of our lives. So for example, when you, you talk to many of the parents or grandparents of the students in our schools today, they all would have walked or biked to school when they were children, or almost all of them. Well, nowadays, almost no children are walking or biking to school. It's very small numbers. And so that's a small change that has occurred very rapidly over several generations that is, is very dramatic. And, and the loss and of leisure time activities, video games, television, yeah. MTV. A lot of the work we've done is focused on, on media use in kids, and particularly screen time with television, videotapes, DVDs, video games. And it's, of course, one of the, the greatest predictors of a child's weight is going to be how much time they spend watching television and playing video games and watching, watching movies on the TV. Um, in addition, what we've learned is that by reducing children's screen time, you actually can have a great effect on their weight gain. So one of the more effective interventions we have, more, one of the more effective things we can do to help reduce risk of obesity in kids is to reduce their screen time. Um, other things is in the food environment, their kids being advertised to all the time, much more than it was in past generations, so that every time they turn around, they're getting other foods advertised to them, usually high in fat and high in calorie foods. That's something that is of, of tremendous interest right now, and you may have heard recently several food companies have gotten the message and, and found out that it's good PR to reduce their advertising uh, to children. Fast um, foods? Fast foods is a, is a big part of that. Supersizing? Billions of dollars. Supersizing. Um, serving sizes, we know that the more you're served, the more you'll eat. And so whether it's supersizing at a restaurant or supersizing at home, uh, portion size is very important. Real quick, uh, kids fixing their own meals. You mentioned that the other day in a conversation. That's right. happening. And that's been another drastic change that we've seen is that the, the, when we were kids, there was no microwave oven for us to prepare our own meals. Now kids can prepare their own dinners 
uh, on their own without parent, parent involvement. And so parents have lost some control over what kids are eating. We're going to have mm -hmm. to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk with Dr. Robin some, some more about how certain elementary students in South San Francisco schools just may hold the key to the solution of this epidemic health problem. So stay with us. Prudential California Realty is pleased to support the South San Francisco Unified School District. With several offices located throughout the South Bay, we help home buyers realize their dreams of ownership and sellers maximize their home investment. Prudential California Realty is a longtime partner with education, having created the Education Foundation in 1992, which provides grants to teachers throughout Northern California. Prudential California Realty, your partner in real estate. You've always been like a son to me, Mikey. And that's why I find it unfortunate that we're in this little situation here. Peninsula TV, how will it affect you? We're discussing the health problems of an overweight younger population with Dr. Thomas Robinson, Associate Professor of Pediatrics and, and Medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine. Dr. Robinson also directs the Center for Healthy Weight at Lucille Park Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford. I want to make sure I got that in for you. Dr. Robinson, please tell us about the study you are currently conducting at several elementary schools in South San Francisco. Sure, I think it's, it's very exciting to be collaborating with South San Francisco Unified School District, and we're extremely happy to be working in six of, of your elementary schools now to help try and develop uh, more effective um, programs to help kids control their weight. There are really two approaches that we're uh, testing. We have funding from the National Institutes of Health that's bringing all these federal dollars into the local district to really help us test uh, two approaches. One is, the, uh, is a more traditional health education approach in which children and parents get a lot of information uh, to help make more healthful choices. The other is an after-school program in which we're promoting more physical activity. In fact, we have some video that, that you've taken that we can show now, and why don't we go to that now and so okay, I can explain the two programs. Let's take a look at the video. Yeah, we call it the Stanford Games Project. It focuses just on girls because girls, in fact, are at higher risk of uh, many of the complications of obesity, particularly diabetes. So it's focused primarily on girls. It's also something that's just for, uh, that is a program that can be just for girls, which is unusual to have programs that for the girls. There tends to be more programs, it seems, in most communities for boys. Mm -hmm. What you're seeing here is one of our evening health education events, and these occur four times a year for participants in the program. And uh, this is one that's being led by a representative of the American Dietetics Association, teaching about fat and cholesterol and good fats and bad fats and how to help prepare healthier meals for kids. As you can see, they're very interactive, and uh, the, both the, the whole family comes to these, and, and the girls love it. In addition to these events, the girls are getting a monthly newsletter that's really more like a little monthly magazine about health that they can collect and uh, help them learn about uh, healthy habits through the year. And the parents also get a monthly newsletter as well that, occur, that, that comes and teaches them how to make a healthier environment for their family mm -hmm. um, around food choices and around physical activity choices, things that can be done in the whole family. Looks like these kids are having a good time. Oh, yeah, and they're very fun. And the girls love to be Stanford Games girls uh, in this program. And the parents, the, the participation rate is really outstanding. And something that we're very proud of is that in these schools, and these are evening events that occur four times a year, and you know how tough it is for parents to get to schools, well, we're averaging somewhere close to 50% in terms of parent and child involvement 
in ah these evening programs the other part of the program is an after school dance class that's focused on particular ah cultural and ethnic dance for ah girls and their second third and fourth grade girls again and girls were chosen at random to go into one group or another like a coin flip and that was the only way to make it fair and also to do a good evaluation of the program and in this part of the program girls are offered a chance to be in an after school program every day of the week while school's in as well as over the summer um we take off school vacations in the during the school year good and ah and they learn a lot of cultural dance they learn ah um traditional dances from different backgrounds as well as popular ah dances some hip hop dance girls get to choose some of the music they do some of their own choreography and this is a way of providing an opportunity for girls to do something after school instead of watching tv instead of being in front of the refrigerator refrigerator all afternoon to help give them some ah ah some physical activity in a very positive manner what's really nice about this is the girls don't do it just because it's physical activity this isn't because it's good for their health and what we're trying to test is to see whether an after school program focused around activity for the girls and here you can see some of the parents participating as well in an activity mm -hmm. is that uh that that this is something that the girls do because it's enjoyable not just because they know it's good for them our our hope is that both of these programs will prove to be successful and that uh we will find that girls in both of the groups uh reduce the amount of weight they gain compared uh to girls in comparison um and so the hope is that that we can come to the district in uh in a couple of years when this is over cuz each program uh is 2 years for each girl and each family so it's a long program so you and, track them right we track them uh for for 2 years each mm -hmm. family and it's 240 different families that are participating in this across 6 schools and uh so it's a lot of the girls now who are in mostly in 3rd 4th and in 5th grade in mm -hmm. these schools and um we go to their home also uh four times or five times to including the beginning but five times over the course of those 2 years and do measurements where they get their height measured their weight measured some of the visits they even uh get blood drawn they do fasting blood tests to look at their risk for diabetes and we've had a a uh, a very good reception with this you'd think that that kids wouldn't necessarily uh be willing to have their their blood drawn for things but they know how important it is and the parents know how important it is to their kids health and we have over 85% of the girls are actually uh have have been able to get uh blood on and get good samples so we're able to give that feedback to the families too in terms of their risk for high blood cholesterol and diabetes and so the students have a sense of pride of being in the project too and so oh, they really enjoy themselves they certainly do and and i think the the girls themselves are the the they're in their attendance and how much they they love the dance instructors how much they love the family fun nights and the the health education events we hear about it all the time they're uh they're really feeling good about being in a program that's just for them and being a part of this uh about an exciting research project too. What was your expectation going in? Well, our expectation going in was that uh we would get a lot of participation. We've worked with the school district before on a couple projects and we know how enthusiastic the parents and the and the district is about uh working on children's health issues and uh and so we thought we would get a lot of enthusiasm going in and we did we have over i think over half of the eligible girls in each school are participating which is really an outstanding uh testament to how much the community really cares about their children's health once uh you concluded the study collected analyzed the data then what well that's when we can come to the district and say we have evidence that these programs are worth doing and also we can go to other schools throughout the country and say that a lot of the schools around the country are really worried about this epidemic that's occurring and of mm -hmm. course funding isn't really available for schools to do much so they want to do something that works and i know south san francisco unified school district is very interested in data and outcomes and so they've been willing to 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 work with us or been anxious to work with us as collaborators to try and come up with solutions to the to this issue and to health problems to try and improve their students health in a way that is rational in a way that isn't just throwing money at a problem but that we can say that we have some evidence that it works or it doesn't work outside of the study i wanted to make sure i asked you this question what can parents do uh getting back to this the to the problem itself what can parents do to help Well parents can do a lot of things. First of all they can be very good models for their kids and parents are the most important models in a child's life. 
And so there's no, nothing that kids, nobody's behavior that kids are going to copy more than their parents. So if parents are eating their vegetables and eating their fruits mm -hmm. and getting five a day, the kids are more likely to do that too. They can, that they can set out healthy foods in the household so that kids, when they come home, aren't exposed to a whole bunch of snacks and stuff. They can help by uh, putting uh, media limits on their kids or screen time limits so that there is some budget that kids can follow in terms of how much time they spend watching TV, uh, playing video games, and playing on the computer. And get them out and do activities with them. I think that's, that's a great suggestion. Dr. Robinson, thank you very much for coming on the program and talking about this e epidemic problem. But there is light at the end of the tunnel, I think. When we come back, we're going to talk to the Director of Nutrition Services in South San Francisco to find out what changes are on the horizon for school lunches. Don't go away. If you live on the peninsula, there's only one place to get the latest news on business, sports, politics, education, and your community. Peninsula TV, Channel 26, the Peninsula and South Bay's Emmy Award-winning programming resource. For more information or for a programming schedule, go to pentv.tv or call us at 650-637-1936. Peninsula TV, your community programming channel. Real Estate with Bobby Decker is for anyone who owns a home or aspires to do so. Everything that is important to or an interesting facet of home ownership will be covered by our program. Please join us. You won't want to miss Real Estate with me, your host, Bobby Decker. Emmy Award-winning Peninsula TV provides a large multifunctional TV studio and video production facility, state-of-the-art equipment, and affordable prices. Let our professional staff and crew produce your company or organization's next video, or create your own TV series and air it on one of the Bay Area's largest community cable channels. Contact Peninsula TV at pentv.tv or call 650-637-1936. With me is Linda Carosi, Director of Nutrition Services and a registered dietitian for the South San Francisco Unified School District. Linda, we usually call this segment Spotlight, but considering uh, our topic tonight, maybe it's more like on the spot. Uh, what children eat and the food provided at school has come under a lot of criticism of late. First of all, how many school lunches does the South San Francisco Unified School District food service provide? I wish I could say we get 100%, but that's not the case. We serve approximately 4,000 meals uh, per day. And that's... Uh, close, to about, close to about three quarters of a million a year. So we're, we're about 40% of our population, our enrollment. What guidelines determine what's offered in school lunches? We participate in what's referred to as a national school lunch program. Uh, that is a state and federally funded program. Subsidized meals are provided. In order to receive reimbursement on these meals, we must comply to certain guidelines. One third of the recommended daily allowances for both calorie level and nutrient level for all of our lunches. Where has the criticism come? I mean, uh, school lunches are criticized. Uh, sometimes for uh, aesthetic reasons, taste reasons, but you know more specifically uh, with our topic in terms of the nutrition provided and and can you talk elaborate on that sure. a little bit? Uh, I, I think that a lot of times people there's always been a stigma I think related mm -hmm. to school lunches. Uh, we've come a long way. We no longer serve the casseroles and meatloaf and things like that. We do serve tater tots and spaghetti together. And mm -hmm. We do that sometimes <laughs> uh, because that's what the, the students seem to enjoy and what their preference is, and it's still within the guidelines. Uh, but what we do is we still offer the pizza and the hamburgers and things of that nature, but we still comply with the regulations, both the USDA regulations for dietary guidelines and the regulations that are set forth on the National School Lunch Program. That means lower saturated fat, um, you know, no more than 30% of the total fat, and it's very well balanced with all the nutrients. What's in a typical school lunch? The most popular is still pizza, and all students seem to enjoy the pizza. We do that every Friday, but we always serve that with fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, whether it be a green salad or vegetable sticks or things of that nature that we know that the students will actually consume, uh, and 100% fruit juice mm -hmm. and also milk. And 
How do you balance uh, what you know is good diet for students and what students want to eat? It's a difficult, it's really very difficult to determine uh, on a whole what all of the students will consume because we have a varied population, mm -hmm. different ethnic population. Uh, but what we do is we actually have taste evaluations. We include the students in taste evaluations at least a couple times a year so we can find out what food products they would prefer. Uh, and, and this is probably the, the, the crux of the question, it, I think, for you, is how much control does, does the food services department uh, or a school district for that, for that matter, since we get so much criticism on this topic, have over what children eat? We can provide the best possible nutrition for the best possible price. Um, we take everything into consideration, their food preferences. Um, definitely, they love the branded items like uh, hot dogs, hamburgers, pizza, things of that nature. But we really try to take a look at the balance of it to make sure it's in the right proportions, portion sizes, right calorie composition. Uh, and also, we have a very extensive program with our computer that our software packet all also balances it out so that we know exactly what ratio of nutrients we're providing for our students. What is, uh, what is out of control? What, what do you not have control of? We offer the fruits and vegetables, but do they always consume them? No. Um, oftentimes, our students want to hurry up, eat their main entree, which is the hamburger, the hot dog, the spaghetti, the chicken nuggets, and they don't want to take the time to eat the fruits and vegetables. That's a common occurrence. So we do offer the fresh fruits and vegetables, but oftentimes they don't take it. So that means we can't control that factor, even though we would like them to consume them. Nor can you control what they bring to school. No, we can't control that either. And sometimes I, I, I think that parents may feel that or think that their, their children are purchasing a school lunch, but oftentimes we see students coming on campus with their Coke in one hand and their donut in the other. Uh, so hopefully the parents are aware of what the, their children are purchasing before they get on campus or after school. So you can't control what they purchase on the way to school, no. what they bring from home, what no. they purchase after school, but you can control what you provide for them during the school exactly. day. Uh, how will the new federal guidelines affect what's being served to school children? Well, I think that our particular school district is, is a step ahead. We are already ab abiding by those regulations, uh, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. We offer the whole grains. They're not always 100% accepted. Uh, and I think that we're doing a great job in this factor. However, when it's mandated that we must include certain things, there may be a fiscal impact on our program, which means more expense to our program as far as the fruits and ve vegetables. What sort of things are, are, are new mandates? New mandates are that we do offer more fruits and vegetables. Right now, it's an option to include fresh fruits and vegetables. We've been doing that on our own, but as you can say, even with the natural disasters, with the hurricanes in Florida, uh, fruits and vegetable prices were soaring very high. So on a couple of the, of the days that we had a menu to fresh fruit, we had to substitute with canned products just because of the fact of the budget concerns. Uh -huh. Well, very good. We've run out of time, Linda. I'm sorry. I want to thank uh, Dr. Robinson from Stanford for being on with us, and of course, Linda Carosi from uh, Nutrition Services in the school district. I'm Bruce Grantham for Our Children, Our Future. See you next time.